Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix Online Meeting 237. June. Early June? Doesn't feel like June, but uh, we'll see. It's 2022. As always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that are not with us right here, right now. What are we doing today? Well, we're doing the things we've been doing for quite a while, which is triage. Uh, if you're here, go ahead and say hi. Ron's already said hi. Ron, great to have you with us. Um, and then we'll do questions and comments if anybody has anything after that. Uh, last week we had a great, I think it was last week, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, last meeting, Ron had a great set of questions and I saw a commit from him that was like totally in line with all that. So that was great. Good conversations and then code comes from it. Good stuff. So if you have more, think about those and then uh, start, you know, figure out how you're going to type them all in. While you're thinking about that, Bob, you ready to do some triage? Maybe? Uh, as soon as I unmute, I am. Yeah. <laughs> all right, here we go. Triage. Boom. Triage starts off with three of the same thing. I really hope they're three of the same thing. And there was actually a fourth one that uh, got closed. That basically comes down to uh, Votive is not installing in Visual Studio 17.2, or that's not fair. It is sometimes installing, or some people are having failures. And uh, we've had four issues opened. Here are three of them that have not been triaged. Uh, and I have linked all of them to a central uh, community issue. What do you call them? I guess that's what you call them. Visual Studio community issue here trying to bring all the data to the Visual Studio team so that they can agree that, oh, something has changed in our installation process and is not working perfectly in 17.2 because we haven't changed anything. So uh, I don't really know what we're going to do with these bugs as they are. So I think the only question is, actually, one person said thanks and actually closed their issue. So I, he's like, all right, I'm going to go follow that or her. Who knows? Uh, the other two, do we preemptively close them thinking this is a pursuit issue do we keep one open uh what do you guys think we should do here we can keep the most active one open um i'm a little worried I... so there's some commonality with with visual studio community edition but then the uh the middle issue the enterprise 95 is explicitly says enterprise because I've had luck installing Votive 2022 into both Enterprise and Professional 17.2. So yeah. yeah, I haven't been able to reproduce this since we yeah, started first no. starting issues. I was like, uh, I don't know. It worked. Both the 18 and the 20 release that has the updated certificate and small bug fixes for 17.2, which are less important now because Visual Studio recognized that their breaking change is going to break a lot of extensions, and so they, they handled that. Um, still need to get that 20 release out, but then we started having all these installation issues, so I kind of paused on getting that out there. And now we're having it with both, so I don't think it's us. <laughs> I, j I just, we didn't change anything. It, or let me say that differently. It could be us, but that means they changed something else in 17.2 that broke things, and we'll have to adapt to that. So we're waiting on feedback on this issue is really what it comes down to. So you want to keep the most active. Unfortunately, is the most active the original? Although the title of that's not great, because he has something else in this one going on where like corrupts VS, a whole bunch of things. I don't know, get his drive or I, I don't know exactly. Yeah, he was actually having problems like running Visual Studio afterwards and so on and so forth. Um, well, the thing is, he's the one that opened that community issue. He is. And I really appreciate that. And he came back and said, oh, there's that. <laughs> And it was really funny, the person in the end, he, he actually left a comment here for a second saying, hey, so they're kicking this back to you. And he followed up with uh, the Visual Studio guy saying, hey, well, it must be a problem with the extension. But then he added a follow-up question on the community th side that said, hey, were you able to reproduce this? And they said, oh, yeah, after trying three times, then we, we saw exactly the same behavior you saw or something like that. And I'm like, so nothing else changed and it works every third time. That sounds like something to look at at the installer, right? Um, but I know, it, it's first line support, first tier support, so they're just trying to make things go away, not have them get to the dev team. Well, as of today, they're, they're oh. they tagged it back for further investigation. Oh, I sh under investigation, yay! I am having the same problem, the workaround suggested do not fix the issue. Thank you for the feedback. The issue has been escalated for further escape. Excellent. 
Excellent. Great. So which of these do we keep open the track, if any? We could open a new one just as a, an explicit tracking issue. Uh, I guess we could. I'm always, you know, this, this is this ancient office thing. I'm always just like, that's really bad etiquette for a, in a testing organization to open, for the dev to open an issue and dupe all the other issues to it because then the, the testers get hits against their dupe, right? But none of that applies here. Sorry, it's just old habits coming through where the tester will show up in your office going, you duped my bug to your new one, but my bug is the same thing. And I'm like, okay, whatever, <laughs> sorry. Well, Mine I was more descriptive that, than your bug, that's all. <laughs> but these are actual dupes, so... Uh, yeah, well, dupes counted against testers. Anyway, nobody cares about that ancient history. There aren't testers don't exist in in office anymore. Anyway, so uh, I don't know that anybody counts like that. Uh, you're right. We could do that. Uh, one I'm also clean fine issue with, with using uh, sixty seven eighty six. It yeah, it is the most active. It has a tie to the the issue. Uh, all the them. issue. We tie it's them not, all together, and they'll be like. One big the, the cert, well, yeah, I don't know. Now I'm waffling because it starts out with the cert, cert issue. Yeah, which is one random thing in all the mix. But it, it, no, you're right. We should create a new one that's nice and clean that essentially says this is tracking this issue against Visual Studio. Here are all the other issues that are related to it. And that way we can pin it up here the way Sean did this one that seems to have headed off a bunch of things so maybe we can head off a few more people saying hey you know this doesn't work in 17.2 and we're like right yeah 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 okay i'll i'll, I'll open that the fact that we got four issues so fast <laughs> it was just like that doesn't happen very often and it didn't happen with 17.2.0 oh is it 17.2.3 well i don't know uh, i don't know if it's that one oh, okay. um and, uh, although that's actually worth mild investigation because I don't think I've tried to reinstall votive after uh, that. Yeah, I have 17.2. I don't think I have 2.2 or 2.3. I'm just curious so, if, um, if if it was 17.2.0 that caused it or mm. or also the fact that you know they went through 17.2.1.2.3 in a couple of weeks. It, it was fast. It, it didn't even reset my counter. I, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't even get to two. It's like, I have a counter for those people who don't follow the, every four weeks, I wait for four weeks before installing a Visual Studio update because they've been pretty disruptive to my life. And after four weeks, I figure, yeah, it's probably good enough. And it happens quite often that within those four weeks, another release comes out and I'm like, yep, glad I didn't get that one. And I just keep resetting my clock then. So yeah, I think that's probably what happens here. Bob, I think you're right. I think the right answer is to open a new issue that's clean, tie all these together, yep. and then see what we come back. And it's always possible some of these will get, you know, we have to unwind some of them. Like the community edition really does have an issue that enterprise does not. Right. Uh, that would surprise me, but, you know, could yeah. be something like that. Then we'll unwind the other ones back. All right. Hey, Pichula, welcome. Uh, number five here. Number five here. I don't know what that refers to. This votive problem. There's oh. five watching. There's five. Yeah, there's, uh, there's five people watching, or there are going to be five Visual Studio issues open. I feel like the count. Five. Whoa, oh, oh. Anyway, let's go. Five will be great. Someone has kids. I do. I'm the only one. Yes, that's right. Explains a lot, doesn't it? Um, that's my excuse. I, I don't know what for, but I'm holding it in my back pocket. Um... This issue came in, and Bob and I both reacted similarly. Wow, they did a lot of work, but did provide the most important piece of information, the log file. Because <laughs> we get Can't this, do nothing without a log. this whole thing to try to reproduce the problem when a log file would tell us what's being held in use. Also, I think this statement here the file use dialog does not appear when doing an install it should not appear during a repair which while that would be nice that's not true it's actually it's almost never true it's, it's usually far more likely to cause you know files in use during a repair because repair or upgrade um yeah that's fair yeah a re repair is always in place so you know of the hierarchy of things most likely to cause files in use Repairing in place is 
a big one. Yeah. So it's not the initial installer who has a problem. So after this person did all this wonderful work, where do we send them? Where do we send this? It's well, end of the day, this you know this really has nothing to do with Wix. It's yeah. about MSI. So um, yeah, I'll suggest posting the log and go take it to a support forum somewhere. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is a classic case where you just convert it to a discussion. Yeah. <laughs> For example, yes. As we've had discussions about off stream. Anyway, inside joke. Uh, fine, that's that goes off as support. All right, now I think we get to the two most interesting issues here, because well, I opened them, um, and uh, and oh, I forgot the link. Ugh, sorry. Anyway, these issues have come up as I've been fixing other issues. Oh, good, I did link to it. Yay. I didn't remember I did. Anyway, um, 6749 is about the fact that you cannot silently uninstall MSUs. I have been working with on this issue on stream, if you've been following along weekly, and came across the question of, should we keep the KB attribute? Because the KB attribute is the thing that indicated that it could be uninstalled or it was used to uninstall it the MSU that is uh, in a bundle. And on the stream, I kind of got nostalgic to keep the KB attribute as a uh, useful piece of metadata about the MSU. And Bob called me a digital hoarder for which I did not have a good comeback. Uh, so I figured I'm That's probably- the best kind. The, a digital hoarder? No, no, well, <laughs> it, no, it's, it's the best kind of, you know, poke when you uh, have a good comeback. <laughs> uh, it doesn't make me feel very good. Anyway. Uh, so anyway, should we keep the attribute on this element or not, knowing that it's not going to do anything? And I'm pretty sure based off Bob's comment here, I, the answer is no. Uh, the, the, the KB number is almost always in the file name. Mm -hmm. So it's it's at least a little duplicative and and it has no other purpose than your nostalgic documentation. All right, I can't really defend this. Uh, you can go ahead and give this to me and I will go roll it with the other one and it will disappear from both the KB and there's no point keeping the symbol if it's not in the language. So how I remove it from the symbol as well. Cool. Cool. Look at that, it's assigned to me already. All right. Uh, all right, this one. I don't know what the answer is this one, and I don't have strong opinions on this one, so I'm just bringing this and hoping smarter people than me have opinions that are good, uh, whatever that means. Uh, so, I've been doing work on the validation of files using hashes versus authentic code and getting that separation or those two options clearly delineated in the language. One of the things I realized while working on that uh, was that you could have a situation where you have one part of the package, like one file of the package is signed authentic code and then another file that is not signed authentic code. And if you then said, I want to use authentic code signature verification, but only one of the files is signed and the other files are not, what should we do there? Is it okay to have only one file being able to be updated or validated with authentic code and the other things not? And I just wanted to talk about that because I was doing this also on stream and I wasn't gonna be able to think all the way through it. And I kind of went, oh, I could go either way. So without my, you know, any opinions there, what do you guys think? There are the cases both where it's the XE pack, in this case, like an XE package here, the XE is not signed, but like the cab that goes with it, I don't know, whatever, is signed versus the other way around where, hey, the XE is signed, but the cabinet is not signed. And we don't have to, they don't have to have the same answers. We just have to- Some files can't be signed. Yes. So it needs to not prevent you from having a signed XE package with unsigned text files next to it or whatever. Right, so that's this case. Do we allow the other case? 
I, I, I kind of figured that was the way that this one would go, that we would need to do it this way. Here, if the XC is not signed, should we do certificate uh, authentic code validation for files that aren't the XC? Or if the entry point package, what the, the package payload, if it's hash based, everything is hash based. I don't really want to do the work to enforce that. <laughs> I'm not, I mean, I, I don't see a huge benefit to, you know, having, having the tool set have an opinion on that matter. Um, I mean, you can, uh, I, I'm having trouble coming up with a use case where it matters, but, you know, Say you need to ship a redist, uh, but for whatever reason you want to wrap it. Okay, this is getting convoluted. Say you have WebView two, and you include it with your, you know, with it with its certificate information, uh, but you want to wrap it to make it prettier. I don't know. And that one doesn't have a certificate. I think this is really convoluted and I don't think there's a use case for it, but I don't see why we should prevent it. All right. So essentially do nothing to prevent either of these scenarios, allow them both to go through. Am I, I just want to make sure I'm playing it back. Right. We had, well, we agree that one has, has to happen, has to be supported. I think the bottom one needs to be supported. Yeah. That the was other my one is guess. Like, meh. Who cares? All right. So don't yeah. block it, which means it'll just go through. If you do that, that's fine. You could do that. It means that you'd be able to update this cab independent of this XE if you wanted. Maybe that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. That was easy. Like I said, I didn't have strong opinions on it. Uh, the ones that we ended up coming back with are not at all surprising. Kind of the way I guess I thought it could go. So that's Good. Wow, is that it? I think that's triage. I think that's everything in triage. That went pretty fast. Uh, yeah, that's not in burn, but that's okay. I don't think is it in burn? Doesn't care, right? Shot or it, it, to be burn clear, doesn't care. this yeah, okay. is burn flavored. I I can't. We don't have we don't have the labels. Uh, to our labels are so messed up. We yeah, but really need to redo our labels. The problem remember is that if it's burn, back. it's going to show up in all of Sean's stuff. So yeah, remember I, I yeah. want us to treat burn differently. We don't. We we need labels to be able to do that. Yeah, don't put burn on this. I, I that that's that says engine to me. I'm fine with that. We're, we're there. Just put binder. I'll, I'll deal with it. It's actually I'm not even sure it's in the binder. I think it's actually in the compiler. But anywho, um, we really. <laughs> And at a certain level, compiler and binder, never mind. I'm not going to label thing right now. We've talked about it before. We just have not sat down and made enough decisions. All right. All of all of the labels are based on V3. We've yes. done very little to bring them into the V4 world. And I agree that we need to do that. I have touched all the issues with burn. So I would like it if we stop putting burn on these kinds of issues. That's fine. We need other labels. That, like I said, we... Our labels are bad. We need new labels so that we can. Yeah. These things are burn flavored, and they impact the the tool set side, the build side. I realize they're not burn engine bugs, but right now we don't differentiate between them, and we should. Yes, we are. <laughs> if you put it on there, I will take it off. Well, yeah, that's that doesn't uh, that doesn't. Disprove my statement. We need to fix the labels. All right, we but we're not doing that now. We're not doing it before. There's too many other things we have to get done first. So yep. that's essentially where it is. It bugs problems. us, but not enough to fix it right now. It's really what it comes down to. Well, because it's not its not an easy fix. I mean, we, we have to look at everything and come up with new labels and or move existing labels. It's a mess. Yeah. Oh, wait. Keeps coming back to their mess. Yeah. I thought triage might have been a little bit more today, but I guess not. 
so we're going back to things that other things going on. Pe things that people want to ask, talk about, questions, comments, other stuff going on that is out there. Anything? It's been pretty quiet. Uh, it does look like we've had another hit in the comments on the Visual Studio issue. So yes, do go upvote that uh, community tracker, whatever they call it, the, the Visual Studio bug tracker feedback site, whatever. So uh, I've been working on the XE package Arpentry detection stuff. And I'm running in, like when I transfer that for the bundles, I'm trying to figure out how this is going to work where if it's not cached, then it falls back to the Arpentry. But we don't really have a concept today of like the caching being optional. So I think I think I need to add a new cache package mode. Like today, we always need to cat like it needs to be cached at the end. But we need a new mode that's like verify only, where it'll try to validate it if it's in the cache, and if it's already validated, then we're good to go. But if it fails validation, then it shouldn't even try to cache it because it can fall back to the package cache or the ARP entry. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, yeah. So you have bundle A that contains bundle B, right? Right. And then bundle A is being uninstalled. And for whatever reason, its package cache is, let's say, cleared. So none of its other none of its child packages are there so if you ask bundle a is bundle b cache the answer is no and today that would mean oh well i have to go get it so i can uninstall it yeah however with this new feature it'd be like oh 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 i see that b is actually installed through arp and i found the xe so you're in luck i don't have to cache it So I think just to make that scenario a little more realistic, um, bundle A never caches bundle B. Yeah, that's the easiest way to get in that scenario. It just says don't cache, right? Or you're, or you're sorry, let me back up. Are you saying it, it has no cache or cache equals remove on it or it has a condition on it so it never installed B? Uh, cache equals remove. All right. So it installed it and cached it, installed it, and then removed it from the cache. Got it. Okay. That scenario. Yeah. That's, that's the, one of the easiest ways to get into this scenario. Mm hmm. So yeah. What would that look like? It, normally the, during plan, the end result for B would be cache equals yes uninstall equals yes or i'm sorry whatever action is uninstall cache is yes true right but because you found it cache does not have to equal true do we need like i'm not against adding another state it's just more states bigger machine um if we well, don't do this are, are we missing so if we say uninstall, but cache is false in plan, that, that can't represent the space well enough? So that the problem with that is where, let's say the package cache got completely deleted. You're running the uninstall from, because you downloaded bundle A, so now you want to go uninstall bundle B. Bundle A needs to go download bundle B because bundle B doesn't exist anywhere on the machine anymore. Right, right, right. In that case, cache would have to equal true. Right. But if B was installed already, could cache equal false and uninstall or, and action be uninstall? Does Would that be able to fully represent the state? 
But when it goes to uninstall bundle B, that's going to fail because it doesn't exist on the machine. The quiet uninstall string is pointing to a file that doesn't exist. In that case, though, cache would have been true up front during planning, right? How would plan have known that in that case needed to be cache equals true? Oh, I, when does, does, I guess that's the question. Um, when is the uninstall string evaluated to find a bundle B? I, my, I would say it would be done during plan. It'd be like, oh, do I have the BXE here? Yes, great, use that. Oh, I don't. Well, let me try to use ARP all within plan to go find it. Uh, because of rollback, I'm needing to get it during execute, during apply. Because of rollback, interesting. What's in rollback that needs it? That was a wrinkle that I didn't think of before, but if you install bundle B, then you install package C, and C fails, it needs to go and uninstall bundle B. Which might not be a good example for bundles, but for the XE package ARP entry is a scenario. Although maybe maybe that doesn't apply for bundles because you should be able to use the cache that you use to install. Yeah, it shouldn't be removed yet, right? It gets removed at the very end. Uh, ideally, all the decision, as many decisions as possible, are made during plan. Like that's that's the thing. So I, I'm I'm still trying to think through the case where this one needs it at runtime, and then See. adding states. So I, if you need the state, you need the state. I I was just trying to do it without the state, but that's without deep uh, without being deep in the burn engine for a long time. Cause Shouldn't some of this happened during detect as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, originally I was grabbing it during detect. Okay. Sure. Yeah, detect would be fine. Yeah. Except in the case where you're installing it, that yeah, but we always have that case. Yeah, where yeah, during yeah. install the state of the machine changes, well, detect is out of date, so you can't use it always for that case. Yep. But you're right. Yeah, could the the uninstall string fact could be detected. Yeah. But then during plan, you would evaluate the string and check the existence of the file, and that tells you whether to try caching it or not. Well, if the file, if the bundle's in the package cache, do we use that one first? I guess which one is preferred, the uninstall string or the package that's in the cache? Well, you you need to validate the cache before you can use it. And that happens during detect. No. the, val the I mean, you're kind of doing a really simple probing of whether a file is there to see whether it's cached, but... Yeah, plan it's a really hash. shallow detection yeah, of but, caching. But, yeah, but plan won't hash the file, right? Sorry, so, I was thinking of detect, um, but it's... Detect I, doesn't hash the files either. Okay, so you can get cache present, cache missing, cache partial. Partial is what I was thinking of. I'm pretty sure I removed partial in four. Oh, well, then that won't be a problem. Yeah, but present at the tech time means it seems to be there, but it's not like present and verified. Okay. So the well, it, is the case, Sean, that you're bringing up then that it's present, but it's wrong. So now right. we have to go do work. Right. If the uninstall string is there, 
how much verification do we do for that of the the thing it points at hmm well i mean if we want to prefer the package cache then we can't decide anything at plan time we need to actually validate the hashes and everything during apply before we can decide whether we actually have the cached package available. Yeah, I, I was thinking that we could make the decision, oh, this is present in the cache, so we'll, we will use that as the preferred uninstall, or as the uninstall, but also note that we have the uninstall string. So if something, if we can't use that file for some reason, we could fall back to the uninstall string at runtime. And that's just where I was going through the, how much do we verify of the uninstall string file? The the uninstall string ends up pointing at a file. How much do we bother to verify that target? So right now, the I have the exe package is basically doing no verification yeah. until it's actually trying to run it. And when it tries to run it, if it's a permachine package, then it verifies it's in program files or the package cache. But it doesn't get, check the hash or that it's a, right, or a cache file. Because no it may not be a cached file, yeah. Because it could point to any file on the system. Yep. Okay. So it's just that there's no verification of the bits of the file at that when using the uninstall string. We don't have anything to compare it against. We don't have a source of truth. We had the hash of the original file, though. Uh, the uninstall, yeah. We have a hash, right. We have a hash of the file that was the install. In the case of a lot of these things, the uninstall XE is, new, is not at all the same XE as the install XE. Yeah, there's all kinds of things you just can't. So you say we can't use the hash of the XE to validate the hash of the uninstall string. Right. Just, that just doesn't happen. Could for a bundle, because they happen to be the same. Oh, that's not true either. Because it's going to be the engine bundle, not the... <laughs> Just the engine part, not the actual attached container. Okay, so there is no verification, no hash verification of the file that the uninstall string points at. Right. I think that's all right. I I get that now. Yeah, so that means that the uninstall string can always be a fallback if the cache is if the cache one isn't present. Could be that could be one way of doing it. Right. That could always be done during plan. I mean, you can grab it during plan. Oh, but it won't help if we... You can grab... Well, we can verify the file exists. So the uninstall string is a file, points at a file. And what do we do if it doesn't exist? Well, we can't use it, right? I mean, if the uninstall string points at a file that does not exist, we can't use that as the uninstall information, right? We. It, well, you, I mean, that's true, but... Uh, so the way I have it today is an XE package will just fail to uninstall when it's trying to execute the package if there's no quiet uninstall string. So, mm, yeah. There's really no other option. <laughs> Except to ignore it. Yeah, this is, this is the tricky part about uninstalls. How much do we prevent things from uninstalling? But maybe that's the force switch is the... No, what are the... For the force uninstall... uninstall. We'll get yeah. the bundle to uninstall itself, even if packages are left behind. Right. 
So that would work around this case where the XE for whatever reason is busted. All right. Uh, so that's that's fine. Uninstall fails if the XE points out a thing that doesn't exist or fails for whatever reason. So then the question is bundle B is in the cache, but it's invalid. The, the files are invalid and the uninstall string points at the package cache somewhere because it's a bundle, but that is invalid as well. I guess I'm just trying to avoid the case where you have to cache again, cache during uninstall, because it's a pretty bad experience. It's a pretty bad user experience. So Prompt for what it, source during so the uninstall is pretty bad. I was thinking like have a verify only mode where it'll try to just go and validate what's there. I guess it could give the BA the option to go and cache the whole thing if it wants. But the default option would be to ignore the cache and then fall back to the uninstall string. And then if that fails, then it fails. Yep. And when you say ignore the cache, if the files are bad, ignore the cache? Yeah, if the files are bad, then don't try to use the original source fall to back. uninstall the bundle. Yeah. If fall back or and if they're bad, all right. If they're bad and there is no uninstall string, we could just fail at that point too, rather than trying to cache the files. Um, I guess I thought I would make it fail later, but. Oh, you'd make it fail later? Like, like when the uninstall happened? Yeah. Ah, I see. So the files are corrupt in the cache, but let's try anyway. Maybe it'll work. Maybe some gigantic cab is, is messed up, but the XE is still there and the XE has all the logic, so everything will work out fine. That that. No, that's not what I was meaning. Okay. I, meant, I meant that I didn't want to try to evaluate the uninstall string during cache. That seemed like something you shouldn't be doing during cache, but I mean, I, I could do it, just something I hadn't considered. I, I wasn't talking about trying to run the files even if they're invalid, because we can't do that. The only thing we could fall back to is the quiet uninstall string. Yeah, I, the more I think about it, the less excited I am about caching during uninstall. <laughs> like the uh, going and getting files and putting them in the cache. So what you just described of the during uninstall, if the files are in the cache, validate them. If they're bad, then we're not uninstalling right now. We're not uninstalling that package. Um, if there, unless there's an uninstall string that we can fall back to. Right. I mean, I would probably add a BA message so the BA can opt in to actually caching it. But During cache verification, turn around and then ask for the file. I see. It essentially be, all right, this file's corrupt. If you could provide it, I'll use it. Um, I was, yeah, I was thinking of the higher level of this package is corrupt. Do you want to cache the entire package? Like, don't do it on a per file basis. Like, as soon as one file fails in validation mode, then you validation mode failed. And then 
it's up to the BA whether it wants to upgrade the cache mode to full mode or whatever. Is it easier if they just go, huh, uninstall cache is busted, just repair? I mean, that's that's essentially what's going to happen, right? I mean, the end result is you repair the cache. Hmm. I'm just struggling with how much to do during uninstall, how much caching to do during uninstall. How much work should the engine be doing in those kind of situations? I mean, it's already doing that for XE packages, so I don't really see it as a bad thing. I mean, obviously the user doesn't want to get file prompts during an uninstall, but if they have to choose between that and the whole thing failing, then they probably would rather get the prompts. I'm thinking about the BA. What's the BA going to do? It's going to say, I mean, what's the default BA say in this case? Yeah, sure, fix it up, which then turns into cache mode, right? Essentially, it goes into caching, and you'll get, then get file prompts, or you'll start getting file source resolution callbacks, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I thought the default would be false, though. Like, try ah. to fall back to the uninstall string if it exists. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, guess. I agree. Yes, if there's an uninstall string, that would I that is the ideal. So, yeah, just fall back to this instead. I guess that would be a reason to grab the uninstall string at that point, so that the caching could verify whether it exists or not, and then the BA could get that information as well when it's being told that validation failed. Well, I was hoping you could do it at plan, get know if there's an uninstall string, and then plan such that the cache action knows, does it have a fallback option or not? So rather than at cache time make the decision, just make the decision at plan so that it's already been made and there's less thinking during the execution of these things. Less reactivity, you know, oh, this file failed to cache. Oh, well, now let's go do the logic to go look at uninstall string. Instead of all that reactivity, try to push all that into plan. So when we look at a plan, you can say, oh, yeah, this plan, this cache operation has the ability to fall back to uninstall string, and it's just stored in the action. That way the, the plan is essentially the transaction log ahead of time. That's the idea of it. I can I can look into that. I mean, I think if it's going to be during plan, it should be during detect instead. Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. But detect is better. Sorry. I keep saying plan, but yes, if you can do it to detect, that's even better. I totally agree. I was detect. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Detect is better. If it can be done in detect, that's great. If it can be done in plan, that's good. Then everything else has to be done in execute. I think that's kind of the, the earlier, the better. Maybe that's the easiest way of saying it. So that execution makes the fewest amount of decisions possible because it makes plenty already. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does that get rid of the need for another state? Um, no, because... <laughs> no, it, it's another bit then, right? It's the fallback bit, right? We still have to have a validate-only mode. 
a validate only mode to where it's not prompting for source when a file fails verification i see it's it's cache and and that validate mode is used during uninstall yeah and there's actually another case where there's somewhere in the code right now that's like skipping the rollback. So if you try to uninstall an MSI, then source is not needed, so it doesn't try to cache the package. But typically the rollback action is to install. So there's code during plan today that says if we don't have source and the rollback is install, then we're going to skip the rollback because we don't have source. Yeah. But as we discussed before, we don't actually know during plan whether we have source or not. We, we don't have verified source. We know if the files are there, we just don't know if they're the correct verified files, right? Right. Right, okay. So that was something that I wasn't able to fix earlier that this could be fixed as well, where it's instead of deciding that during plan, it'll be during cache, it'll try to validate whether the package is actually there. And if it's not there, then it needs to change, it needs to block the rollback install action somehow. Yeah, those two actions have to be tied in some way. Mm -hmm. We have a couple other, or some other places of that. Not many, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that... Is it similar to the scenario where you're... No. Yeah, when you're in a normal install of an optional, a non-vital package, if caching fails for a non-vital package, the install operation has to get skipped. Right? right. Yeah. There, there's some tie between those already. This is the same sort of... This is almost exactly the same sort of thing just when you're running in backwards. Right. Yeah, that that makes sense. That that all ties together. Yeah, I I could see that being needed. I don't know if that helps you, but yeah, I I can see how you get into that spot. Yep. And then yeah, the this, details. This uh a little bigger than I expected. There's always something. But, yeah. I'm, I'm quite used to that right now. I'm getting a lot of those at work right now. I'm trying to fill a little bit of time while Ron writes a multi-paragraph situation report, which is interesting. Uh, he has to split it into, what are we at, 200 characters? So, yeah, 200. I don't know if he's writing it in notepad and then pasting it paragraph by paragraph. It's 200, I don't know, how many, how many characters are in a, Two or how long is a two hundred character paragraph? Bob might know that off the top of his head. That is the well, appropriate. Well, shorter size. than a tweet. Oh, that's true. Two hundred eighty characters, right? Yeah. Shorter than a tweet. Mm. Why didn't they make it two eighty? That would have been no. That's probably a little bit too on the nose. Um, two eighty is what one forty times two, which was one forty was the old or is I guess the current SMS message, but all the software on phones today just kind of blurs that line and I think sends multiple messages. Mm -hmm. All right. Ron's had five minutes to post more than a sentence. 200 characters is not a lot. Just trying to make sure he didn't fall asleep or something. Get bored with a detailed, in-depth conversation about the burn engine where I'm trying to dig up all these ancient things and Sean's pointing all the details. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> forget about that one. How could anyone think that's boring? <laughs> well, if you don't work in burn, I'm sure you're kind of like, wow, there's a lot of things over there. Yeah. Um, 
if you are interested in burn, you can learn quite a bit of detail from those small things. And then go drop in the code and be like, oh, okay, I see how this all fits together. That's the dream anyway. All right, Ron, I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm going to poke now at the next time slot. That would be the 23rd, June 23rd, I think. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it seems like a normal day, June 23rd, uh, 9.30. I'm waiting for Ron to drop a sentence or something in here. Anything? At least get us started. A dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I, I mean, isn't that what the all the messaging apps do these days? Dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And then, except I actually need a physical enter after it for it to get sent to us. Ron, you're killing me, man. One, two, three. Oh, I don't know. Maybe he's going to ending with my signal. So I think that says that he's sending this. He's going to send it here and not like in an email somewhere. We'll email. That nope. sounds great. We'll email. There we go. I think that sounds like a great plan because if it's multi paragraph, yeah, this is a very hard place to put it. It's not exactly a chat thing. All right. Two weeks. We'll do all this again. 9 30 Pacific again. Uh, June 23rd. We'll do triage again. We'll talk about progress and everything that we've done probably. Uh, and I guess we'll see what happens. I, every time I'm like, yeah, maybe we won't have many things to uh, triage. It'll be a very quick meeting. But then we always show up with something. Uh, Visual Studio gave us a lot of the excitement this week. Um, that's it. Two weeks from now, we'll be back. And we'll do all this June 23rd. Till then, you guys take it easy. Bye. Bye. Bye.